Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a Miller Center webinar to discuss the <clears throat> documentary Statecraft, the Bush 41 team. Today, we're facing three crises that seem so existential, the pandemic, an economic crisis, and a racial justice reckoning. And it seems as though it's all brand new, but of course, we've had crises before. Just in our own lifetime, we've had similar crises in the United States. Um, and the film that we're gonna to discuss today traces crises that seem just as existential. Um, the Bush team just over 30 years ago faced the end of the Cold War, reunification of Germany, a crisis in the Middle East, as well as economic crises and racial justice issues. And together they worked as a team and this documentary explores what works and what didn't, didn't work. Um, but effectively they were as a team, one of the most responsive and successful in managing crises that threatened the whole planet. And we're delighted today to discuss the film with both participants and scholars and historians and journalists who covered those crises. Uh, it, the project itself was a project of teamwork and we've been thrilled to work with VPM, Virginia's public media uh, home in Richmond to put together this undertaking and have it broadcast on national PBS. As with all teamwork, there was a lot of players involved. And in this case, it started with our scholars in oral history who had painstakingly assembled the core content for this project almost three decades ago by doing interviews with the senior members of the Bush team. We worked closely then as well as now with the, Ger the George Herbert Walker and Barbara Bush Foundation and Library as well as the senior members of that administration. One of our own faculty members has served in both functions. My predecessor, Philip Zellico, was both a member of that Bush team and uh, working along with Condoleezza Rice, Bob Zellick and others, uh, and has been the director of the Miller Center, including helping establish and uh, sustain the oral history program. We've also been lucky to work with a network of historians, journalists, policy scholars, um, and others who know these times and know the Miller Center, as well as our own governing council and the University of Virginia. And we are lucky to have two of those journalists participate with us in the panel today, one of whom is also a member of our governing council. We've partnered with a filmmaker, Lori Shinseki, who directed this film as a gifted national documentary filmmaker and who happens to be a Charlottesville resident. And she brought a passion for storytelling, a passion for public service, as well as working closely with our own team of audio and video professionals, as well as uh, librarians and other scholars. And finally, we were able to team up with an organization that knows how to build a national audience, and that's VPM. Jamie Swain, who's VPM's president, and Steve Humble, VPM's chief content officers, have been partners all along the way in this project. Um, and not just on this project, but building and sustaining uh, the ability to produce quality content and work with national PBS to get this film broadcast. So we are gonna now show a trailer for the film. And after the trailer is finished, we'll be joined by Jamie Swain, the CEO of the Virginia Foundation for Public Media and president of VPM, who will introduce our panel. Finally, I wanna thank the George, George and Judy Marcus whose support of the Marcus Democracy Praxis Fund allowed us to pull this panel together today. The idea of the fund is to support efforts that bring the spirit of democracy into the actual practice of politics and public service. And I think this film, both its subject and the putting together of the film demonstrate the spirit of what George and Judy Marcus want to support. So thank you to them and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Thank you. 
The more I study the end of the Cold War, the more amazed I am that we're all still alive. Gorbachev bewildered us. 30,000 nuclear weapons. He had 5 million men under arms. All of the elements of the Cold War are still in place. The human beings not only had the ability to destroy all life on the planet, but really thought hard about doing it. George Bush took office at the beginning of three years of non-stop foreign policy crises. Things were moving so fast on the ground. That's a way to do it if you're going to do it. Do it right. Do you want to go to war? At every inflection point, at every crisis point, whenever the pressure built, Bush time and again preached calm and confidence. The passion for freedom cannot be denied forever. The time is right. Let Europe be whole and free. They understood that this was a once in a century opportunity to reshape the earth, and they better get it right. When you talk about statecraft, you are talking about somebody who understands your interests, your values, brings them together and negotiates diplomatically. One can learn something from the arts of diplomacy. The liberation of Eastern Europe and the reunification of Germany, victory in the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union. You talk about closure. jump in. My name is Jamie Swain. I am president of BPM, CEO of the Virginia Foundation for Public Media. It's great to have you all here today. Uh, I want to thank Bill and the entire Miller Center team. We're so grateful that you approached us with this project. I, hopefully you all got to see the film last night. I think if you did, you got to see the in-depth interviews uh, with everyone that we could get on the Bush 41 team, as well as amazing assets. And we couldn't have done that without this incredible partnership with the Miller Center. And huge thanks as well to Lori Shinseki, the producer. Uh, the film could have been three hours. In fact, we had some much longer cuts and she did an incredible job distilling it so you could get a good sense of, of the totality of the Bush 41 uh, foreign policy dream team, if you will. The VPM team has been uh, hugely important in this process. I wanna thank Steve Humble, the chief content officer for VPM, who's been a champion of this for uh, along the way and Ellie Hannibal, who did a terrific job. I also want to thank our partners at PBS, who uh, I think saw tremendous value in this film, and we were very proud for it to run last night to PBS stations across the country. Never fear if you missed it, though, it is available online. You can just go to pbs.org and you can stream the film through September 1st. So if you haven't watched it, uh, please uh, share it with your friends uh, and, and watch it again. So thank you for that. I want to get right into the panel, though. We have an amazing uh, discussion set up. Uh, and so I will hop right into it. The first panelist is actually, oh, sorry, our moderator is Ann Compton. We couldn't actually ask for a better moderator, Ann. Thanks for being here. Distinguished journalist, you all know her from her work at ABC News. In 1974, she actually became the first woman assigned to cover the White House full time for any uh, network organization. During her time at the White House, she covered seven different administrations. She's an enormously respected journalist, including by myself. Uh, she's won an Emmy, a Peabody, a Silver Baton from the DuPont Awards, uh, and has been inducted into six Hall of Fames and received five honorary degrees. So I think you'll agree that she is the perfect moderator for today. Susan Glasser is a staff writer for The New Yorker and author of the weekly Letter from Trump's Washington, as well as a global affairs and analyst for CNN. She served as an editor for Politico, editor-in-chief for Foreign Policy Magazine, and spent a decade at the Washington Post. With her husband, Peter Baker, she has written two books, including one that's coming September 2020, called The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James A. Baker III. So welcome, Susan. 
Barbara Perry is the Gerald L. Belisles Professor and, and Director of Presidential Studies at the University of Virginia's Miller Center, where she co-directs the Presidential Oral History Program. She has authored or edited 14 books, including 41, The Inside Presidency of uh, George H.W. Bush. Professor Perry has conducted over 100 interviews for George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George Bush, and Barack Obama for their Presidential Oral History. Welcome, Barbara. Philip Zellico is the White Burkett Miller Professor of History and J. Wilson Newman Professor of Governance at the University of Virginia, where he has also served as Dean of the Graduate School and, as you heard, was the Director of the Miller Center. Philip has served at all levels of American government. His federal service during five administrations has included positions at the White House, State Department, and Pentagon. His last full-time government position was as counselor to the Department of State, a deputy, a deputy to Secretary Condoleezza Rice. He is one of the few individuals to serve on the President's Intelligence Advisory Board to presidents of both parties, which he did for President George W. Bush and Barack Obama. And finally, Bob Zellick is the non-executive chairman of Alliance Bernstein, a leading global investment management firm he is also senior fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Bob has an, a very distinguished background, including president of the World Bank, a U.S. trade representative, and deputy secretary of state. During Bush 41's administration, he served as counselor to the secretary of treasury, under secretary of state, as well as White House deputy chief of staff. He has received a number of awards, but one that stuck out to me was the German government giving him the Knight of Commander's Cross for achievements in his, his role in the course of German unification. He also has an upcoming book, America in the World, A History of U.S. and Diplomacy in Foreign Policy. So uh, lots to read for folks after they see the film, many great books to cover uh, this important topic and this important uh, moment in our history. So with that, Anne, let me turn it over to you. <coughs> Jamie, thank you very much, and thanks to the panelists who've gathered. We are here to uh, take your questions, and if you will go look down at the chat at the Q and A function at the bottom of your screen, please put in uh, uh, your questions for the panel, and I will get to as many of them as I can. And if you can, tell us where you are as you're watching with us today. Uh, we're going to answer your questions, but first, I want to start real briefly with the panelists. Um, you know, documentaries are done with the advantage uh, of 2020 hindsight, but when we were all going through uh, this kind of history of those Bush years, uh, it's not as clear when you're wading through it. I want to start, Bob Zellick, you uh, were in the room where it happened. Uh, you <laughs> can see repeatedly in the documentary where you are cropping up there in the cabinet room and right behind the president. And you're publishing your book this year, uh, America in the World. The pivotal moment, wasn't it really the fall of the, world, uh, the Berlin Wall, which set in motion such a global change? Well, first, um, and I want to thank you, and uh, particularly Lori Shinsecki uh, did a fantastic job. So I really enjoyed it in the Miller Center and BPM. So uh, uh, moving and informative. So I hope hope other viewers enjoyed it as well. Well, you you mentioned my book, and it's interesting that the title of my chapter on President Bush is Alliance Leader, and I'll put the Berlin Wall in in, in the context. I think you know, in some ways, President Bush was the natural and most successful leader of alliance. But recall for the first 150 years of the United States, we tried to stay away from alliances. There was no permanent alliances, no entangling alliances. Then in 1947-49, through a series of frankly unplanned events, we create this unique system of political, diplomatic, economic security arrangements and for 40 years, American presidents uh, have to struggle with it, with, with uh, frankly, uh, some very dangerous and also difficult times. President Bush was a master of this process. Um, and so before the Berlin Wall, something we may want to talk about, there were a lot of events that he set up, uh, including with a conventional forces proposal and others, it was sort of based on, on his experience. But another part that um, people may want to dig into, and this is an area that I think both Susan and Phil have focused on, is that the Bush-Baker relationship is truly unique. Um, one thing that may or may not come through in the documentary fully is that while President Bush was a gentleman, he was also fiercely competitive. 
And, and it was a combination of prudence and restlessness. And then the question was, how did this get operationalized? And one has to understand the Baker relationship as the operational art of diplomacy with this president. And in a sense, almost non-communicative understanding about trying to uh, advance the agenda. The second point I'll make um, in terms of the context is a lot of the focus understandably on President Bush is how he ended the Cold War peacefully and a huge accomplishment. But there's often less attention to the fact that in many ways, his administration laid the foundations for the Clinton and Bush 43 administration. So for four years, he basically sets up the next 16 years. Because if you think in addition to what was covered in the show, he completes NAFTA, a critical North American relationship and trade. He almost completes the Uruguay round, another trade arrangement, APEC with Asia, the Middle East peace process that Baker launches afterwards. One that's very little known is that the only climate change treaty that the US has ratified was done in 1992, and it's still the framework for things like the Paris Accord, the UN arrangements. So I'll just close with this point is that while it's important to understand what Bush ended, it's also important to understand what he began. Well, that's a good point. And Phil, Philip Zellico, you were also in the room where it all happened. And you are publishing a book with Condoleezza Rice, the former Secretary of State, called To Build a Better World. And you do project into the future. Do you see the same contours here that, that what came in the, that compact four years of the Bush term really had a defining influence, Philip, on, uh, on where, uh, where, where we all headed after that? Uh, yes, thank you, Anne. Um, the reason Condi and I wrote our book, To Build a Better World, um, to recount the developments of the late 80s and early 90s, was not just to tell the story of the past, but was to prepare people for the crisis that we think we're drifting into right now. So just to put this in a broad global historical perspective. The world in the last 250 years, the last quarter of a millennium, We've had five global systemic crises. Four of those five crises were resolved by cataclysmic wars. One of the five was resolved peacefully and successfully transforming the world without killing tens of millions of people. One of the five. And that's the episodes that are in this PBS documentary. That's the transformation of the world that occurs between 1988 and the end of 1992. Point. We think we are now drifting into another period of major global systemic crisis in the 2020s. That's why it's so urgent to revisit how did we get through the last such systemic crisis peacefully. You know, and that's the story we tell. And, and I want to uh, hold you on, on some of these thoughts. This is exactly where we want to head with this program. But I want to also bring in Susan uh, Glasser and Barbara Perry um, by showing you this. The fall of the Berlin Wall is an indelible moment. But look where it led. Watch this. It's coming. <laughs> And the Excellency, Dr. Helmut Kohl, Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany. In February of 1990, at a, a crucial meeting at Camp David, we signed Kohl up to go fast. And that was, again, extremely courageous on his part. Uh, we share a common belief that a unified Germany should remain a full member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, including participation in its military structure. Some of my mm -hmm. colleagues and I at the State Department came up with this idea of two plus four. And the numbers are quite significant because what we were doing was we're saying the Germans are in the lead. Two Germanys. West Germany and East Germany. Plus the four powers. The four powers who fought and won World War II against Germany. That became the mechanism by which we negotiated the final settlement agreement. In helping Germany achieve freedom and unity, I believe all the states and peoples of Europe can be winners, and that should be our aim in these talks. 
Now this this is an important uh, section of the uh, of the documentary. And Susan, you're a journalist who lived through this. You and your husband Peter Baker uh, lived and worked in Moscow during the second uh, during the uh, uh, but but uh, over a decade later, and what you saw, the legacy of about a, a decade later was really dictated uh, by by what. Uh, by the events that the Bush administration uh, helped create during the uh, during the years he was in office, Susan. Yes, well, thank you, Anne, and and thank you to everyone. It really is a terrific film in many ways, in part because it suggests uh, just how much of an inverse moment uh, 1989, 1990, 1991 were to this moment that we're experiencing now. Uh, you know, and I I think Phil Zelikow's comments are. On the mark, although I only my only question is whether we're drifting into that crisis or we're already in the crisis, uh, and uh, it does feel uh, most days to me like we're in the crisis. As I speak to you from home on Zoom, because I'm unable to go anywhere because I, you know the world has failed completely uh, to deal with a global threat that it anticipated. By the way, and those alliances and that multilateral approach. Uh, of integration of globalization essentially uh, is being tested uh, or is unraveling depending on your perspective uh, more than ever before. And so flash forward to our experience in, in Russia, Vladimir Putin's rise was the period of time uh, that we lived in Russia. He now, of course, is the longest serving Russian leader since Joseph Stalin. And he has been animated, certainly on the geopolitical stage uh, by the grievance of essentially what he views as a, a Cold War defeat in which Victor's terms were imposed upon uh, Russia. And uh, now, uh, you know, those who were actually involved in the events, Bob Zelik, Phil Zelikow, they know very well uh, that President Bush and Secretary Baker were animated by a desire not to spike the football, as uh, George H.W. Bush often would say. Uh, and in fact, he came under enormous heat from journalists like you who were covering him, uh, because even when the wall fell on that incredible day- I don't know, yeah, they didn't do it. For 1989, he seemed uh, almost determined to, you know, throw rain on the parade, whereas the rest of the world was literally dancing. So what I would say is that, uh, you know, you can look at it either way. From the perspective of the Russians, from the perspective of Putin, uh, this is uh, a victor's unfair justice. He called the breakup of the Soviet Union the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 21st century. He has a narrative, uh, not necessarily a factual narrative, about uh, you know NATO expansion as being the original sin of this new world order. The flip side is you could say, well, it's lasted us for a generation since the end of the Cold War largely peacefully and now we're moving into a different period uh, and we are essentially that time has come and gone i, I want to ask barbara our political our uh, our political scientist who has conducted so many of these oral histories for the miller center with sitting presidents and hundreds of their staff barbara the word statecraft does this documentary kind of give it a new meaning? What does statecraft mean? Right, well, thank you, Anne. Uh, and of course, Philip and, and Bob have practiced statecraft and, and Susan and you have covered it up close and personal. So as a lay person coming to this topic, uh, because I tend to focus more on domestic politics and, and government, uh, I actually looked it up. And it, it's the definition, it's very simple definition, very pithy, is the skillful management of the affairs of state, which would be foreign policy, of course, and defense policy. Uh, but it went a little bit further. And, and by watching this film, I have learned to sort of put some flesh on that on those bones. And that is to say, uh, it's, it's deliberative, statecraft is deliberative, it's disciplined, it obviously involves diplomacy, and it involves the big picture. If it's done well, if it's skillfully managed, that means that a president and his administration, someday her administration, we hope, uh, will have a strategic vision of the world and of the United States place in that world. And then they will understand the tactics of how to reach that vision. And so what you will see in this film, and I watched it last night, I think for the fourth or fifth time, I learned something new each time I watch it, is that each of the participants will mention, they'll say, well, here are some of the tools of statecraft, or uh, we have to focus on these alliances because as Jim Baker says, they're for 
force multipliers for the United States. So those were some of the takeaways that, that I had from the film and uh, listening to my colleagues for so many years. And I know Philip has actually taught a whole course uh, on statecraft. Uh, so he may want to jump in as well. Well, I have got a, a load of questions now from our uh, from our viewers. Thanks to all of you who are participating. And again, you can go down to that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, be happy to know where you are as you're watching this morning. I'm gonna start from one from John Smith. I assume that's his name, not a, a pseudonym. <laughs> and John Smith asks, would, it would appear that none of the crises depicted in the documentary threatened the continuity of our democratic form of government in a way it is currently being threatened. I'm going to ask perhaps uh, Philip, first of all, is that threat there today? Uh, yes, in a way it is, uh, because we're facing, when you go through a global crisis of this scale, it challenges existing systems of government. So for instance, in the at the beginning of the 1930s, we were convulsed with an economic crisis that called into question the American form of government. And meanwhile, there was a global political crisis, the rise of the dictators with their programs of foreign conquest, because people were trying to create a different world order. And that led to a cataclysmic series of wars. Um, at the end of the 1980s and early 1990s, one system of government, the communist system, collapsed. But just before it collapsed, it was capitalism that had been in crisis. And indeed, one of the uh, things that triggered the communist collapse was the way capitalism comes out of its crisis in the mid-1980s, challenging the communist system's viability. And then they question themselves and start reinventing their system which leads to the general collapse, except in China, the largest mass movement in the whole world for democracy in 1989 was not in Eastern Europe, it was in China, but they crushed it. Uh, there are a lot of Chinese today who would still like to move towards more political participation. And that's part of the systemic crisis we're in right now. And I is think in America, in China, all through the world, people are questioning their systems of government. And meanwhile, we have an economic crisis. And meanwhile, we have rising military tensions. All the more reason to think about statecraft. Right, and isn't it interesting <clears throat> that it struck me that the, the uh, statecraft documentary does not hit the, one of the most significant moments, which happened just, what, 10, 10, 12, 14 weeks after President Bush took office, Tiananmen Square doesn't get, get a mention. I have a question from Harvard University, Michael Miner, who says thank you to all of you on the panel today. He said, I teach students of national security affairs and often point to the Bush 41 team as an example of what is possible when good people work hard together to meet known and unknown challenges of the day. If you could go back in time, he asks, and offer advice to yourself as a student, what are the skills or issues you would focus on developing for public service in an uncertain time? And what is something you realized was essential once you were in government? I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask Bob to answer this because Bob, you've been all over the government. You were president of the World Bank. And you did you have you ever had those moments of flashback? I only if if only I had thought of it, or if only I had known earlier. Bob? Well, this is one that uh, I think Phil and, and Susan would add a lot to because I, I had the good fortune of working with Baker for eight years and uh, people uh, could see him on the show. And whether it was through education or whether it was through combination of our approach, there's a key, a lot of people talk about foreign policy, they gab about it. There's a lot of communication about this or that. And, and I apologize for international relations scholars, this framework or that framework. The reality is you're facing problems and how are you going to try to address those problems with some idea of the overall context. So you need to have some sense of tools, you need to have a some sense about how you accomplish things. And Baker was obviously a master at that, particularly given his relationship uh, with the president. So coming back to the question for the student, you know, <laughs> it may seem a little ironic, but some legal skills aren't so bad either, as you saw in, uh, in Baker's experience, which is uh, getting the facts, trying to focus on the issue, whether it's negotiation, whether it's advocacy, whether it's putting together a, a, a coalition. But I think um, 
the most important uh, sort of bottom line is that beyond the, the, the BS, frankly, you have to have a sense of what you're trying to accomplish each day and how the dots are connected. So this, the, the film does a wonderful job of kind of racing through these events. But you can imagine as a participant, it makes you, it reminds you of all the things that had to happen along the way so that the dots fit together to accomplish something. Yeah, I want to, I have a question for Susan uh, that just came in from Max Castro Paredes. I hope I'm saying that correct. A question for Susan Glasser, during your research for your forthcoming book on Jim Baker, what did you find the most surprising in studying Secretary Baker's career, Susan? Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I would just to make uh, to to go to Bob's point. Um, you know, Secretary Baker, uh, I think, widely held to be a, a gold standard, both political operative and also uh, both Treasury Secretary, White House Chief of Staff and Secretary of State, that's sort of a, a combination of jobs, a portfolio uh, that he amassed, essentially, you know, at the highest levels of government from the end of Watergate to the end of the Cold War that you just can't even imagine taking place today. You know, Karl Rove and Henry Kissinger are thought of as having very different uh, skill sets. So how is it possible that one person navigated all this? I will tell you, going to the previous question from the, the Harvard professor, Jim Baker was not a good student at Princeton University. He went there because his dad had gone there. Uh, and in fact, his dad had to really lobby pretty hard to get him in. Uh, you know, he, he managed to be treasury secretary with one undergraduate course in economics. Uh, we asked him, I remember, you know, having spent years uh, thinking about the Soviet Union and the former Soviet Union asked him, you know, his uh, framework of, you know, thinking about that, you know, he, the answer is he didn't have a big one. Uh, you know, his main connection uh, to Russia when he was growing up was that he had a white Russian tennis coach in Houston uh, who was as close to him as a second father. So I say that because it's not too late uh, for anybody. Uh, what he did have uh, was incredible discipline, uh, an incredible bullshit detector. Uh, he, uh, you know, an incredible work ethic. Uh, and uh, as, as Bob mentioned, he was enormously competitive, just like the man who became his uh, doubles partner at the Houston Country Club and best friend, George H.W. Bush. Uh, to the question of what did Peter and I learn that was most surprising about Secretary Baker, probably anyone who's listening to this or watched the film is familiar with his um, incredible resume. Uh, but uh, probably like many of them, I was unfamiliar really with the extent to which uh, his early life did not suggest that he would end up doing uh, what he ended up doing in American life. And, uh, you know, that to me, the extraordinary personal tragedy of uh, his young wife dying uh, when she was not even 40. He had four young sons. His wife had uh, cancer. Uh, and uh, the extent to which you could actually call Jim Baker the most successful mid-career change uh, in certainly modern American history, I think, <laughs> was something that, that I took away from it. That, that, that's wonderful. Barbara, I want, I have a question here that, um, that kind of plays off of this, and I think it might be good for you. Brian Craig, watching from Charlottesville, says, many times in history, presidents have brought in their friends that they trust to help in their administrations. What made Bush's situation successful? I don't know that Nick Brady, his friend, was the best Treasury Secretary in the world, or whether some of the other uh, administration people were. But what what strikes me, Barbara, is you've interviewed not only the presidents, but the, for oral histories for the Miller Center, you've interviewed so many of the staff. Have presidents, even beyond Bush, brought in the best people, or too often relied on close friendships? Well, let, let me say, first of all, thank you, Brian, for that question. Brian Craig is uh, one of our senior researchers at the Miller Center, and he puts together these massive briefing books uh, that we couldn't do our oral histories without. So thank you. And he's a presidential uh, expert in his own right, along with Rob Martin, our other uh, senior researcher. Uh, so uh, to, to this point, um, I think in the case of uh, George Bush 41, that uh, to, to this concept that we've been talking about the team, uh, I thought it was so interesting that in his oral history that uh, Dick Cheney did for the Bush 41 project, he said, we assembled 
And President Bush put together the, the A plus team. It was that platinum standard foreign policy team with our colleagues today from the panel included in that. But he said, one thing that we hadn't been able to do by definition is that we all hadn't worked together before. And, and Bob mentioned that you're, you're faced with, you're drinking from the fire hose, you're dealing with one problem and crisis after another. And so what Dick Cheney said was that the Panama crisis, which happened so early in the administration, was a chance for that team obviously to have to work together and then figure out how to move forward with that. So I think that's one important thing. But I, I do I get the sense, first of all, that in all these interviews, I always end them by thanking the participants in our oral history interviews for their service to our country. And whether an individual agrees or disagrees or is an independent or a Democrat or Republican, most of these people want the best for our country. And they try to do the best for our country. And we're grateful for that because most of them could be earning lots more money in the private sector. But I do on occasion, and I think of, for example, the, the Irish mafia around President Kennedy uh, or the Georgia mafia around President Carter, uh, all of these people bring in friends from home and people who've gotten them to the White House or got them to a governorship or to the Senate. And so it's human nature, but I think that presidents do need to be careful to make sure one, people are qualified, two, that they're not corrupt, three, that they're not going in, a, in effect of that, uh, try to make money off of uh, the process of serving the country. Very quickly, Barbara, I don't know that most people understand when you do a, an oral history, you don't just walk into the room and put a tape recorder down and say, start talking, what do you remember? Talk of just about those briefing books that you carry in with you and share with the person being interviewed uh, and how they, they literally do all the research for the person. And you, then you walk the person through that moment, all those in, uh, kind of intimate moments of history. Right, well, Philip has been so involved in this process as a, a leader and director at the Miller Center and as someone who's been interviewed and served on a team. And Bob, of course, has been interviewed, so they will know well this process is that, yes, we produce, for, for example, for Condoleezza Rice, the briefing book was this thick. It was about three to four inches thick. And with our researchers putting together a timeline of that individual's life and almost a TikTok of a day-by-day -day description of what they did in the White House or in the executive branch. We also interview uh, leaders in Congress. We interview, we did, for example, the Ted Kennedy oral history. So we interviewed his family, his staff members, journalists who worked with him. And so what we do is we sort of style these uh, as seminars and the person who's being interviewed is the leader of the seminar. So we don't want to just say, here are the topics we want you to talk about or push the button, go, tell us whatever it is you want to tell us. We do want to know what they want to tell us, but then we try to prod with questions. Uh, and what they often say to us is, thank you so much for this briefing book. Uh, some of them will say, you know, I'm not going to write a memoir. So this will be the story of my life in the White House or the executive branch. And oftentimes they'll say too, because they're drinking from the fire hose, they can't remember once they left every day exactly what happened. So it gives them the opportunity to go back and reflect on that. We put in primary sources, speeches, uh, et cetera. And it, it certainly prepares us. And it also, it, it has the effect of uh, preparing them. And when you go on the Miller Center's website to see which of these interviews have been cleared by the participants, you, we also put up that timeline because that's our own proprietary material. It, we do copyright it, but we put that up for students, for teachers, for those who are learning the art of statecraft. That's it. And, and can I just make one over. point? Yes, go ahead. On, on this friends, I'll be very briefly, uh, but if, if look at the situation today and who's around the president. And so, you know, it's a, it's a fact of life or of constitutional life that um, U.S. presidents don't have equals, but it's important for them to have some peers. And those peers will often be people who they've known earlier in their life um, that, and most important, that are willing to be honest with, that are willing to be straight most often in private, not in public, uh, but to help a president that sits on top of all these different demands and all these uh, institutions. And uh, what I think is, has often worked best is if those peers have had some breadth of experience, whether it's private sector, different types of government. So to use the case of Baker, and Susan mentioned this, Baker had extraordinary political as well as governmental experience. I mean, as you had others around the president who played their role. 
And so I think in a way, as one looks at a president and the success, I'm just reading Sue Eisenstadt's book on, on, on Jimmy Carter. He had some loyalists, but their breadth of experience was not that wide and it affected kind of the types of advice that he could get. So ironically, as you think about a president, think about the people around the president. If I could uh, jump in on this too. Um, notice, by the way, uh, what happens with the Reagan administration. Reagan comes in in 1980, 81. He's surrounded by the Californians, some of whom are narrow in just the way Bob Zellick just mentioned. Reagan, though, remedies that by bringing in as his chief of staff the man who had managed the campaign of his main opponent in the 1980 primaries. He brings in Jim Baker, who had worked <laughs> for George Bush as his chief of staff, and he brings on George Bush as his vice president. So uh, this was a crucial addition to the, as I think Susan will agree, this is a crucial addition to the Reagan team that helped give Reagan some of the successes he achieved in his first term. Susan, I have a question for all of you, but, but I will begin with Susan. Several of the questioners uh, in our audience uh, ask whether this documentary was too, while it was interesting, uh, uh, Victor Naka says, but uh, it was more of a peon than a critical assessment. And uh, if, I, if I pronounce it as a Chimayana Obi asks, in the last few years in Europe, we have seen a higher propensity of skepticism in the European Union in Europe. Does that put into question the work that was put into the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Soviet Union? Were they right? Susan, I'm going to start with you. Well, you know, it is a really uh, good question. I mean, again, you can look at it from the perspective of, you know, is 30 years a great success uh, or is it, uh, you know, a sort of a festering uh, sore that's been there. I, I, it seems to me that when we were thinking about this period of time uh, in, the, in the Bush administration, what I kept coming back to was that history seems much more inevitable, uh, you know, in hindsight than it did at the time. And that actually the window for this unification of Germany to occur was an extraordinarily short window of time as it turned out. Why? Well, number one, because of events inside the Soviet Union. Uh, the unraveling of Gorbachev's hold on power was occurring very quickly. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, Edward Shevardnadze, who was a key partner of the Americans of, of Secretary of State Baker, uh, actually quit his position as foreign minister and warned Gorbachev that a hardline coup was coming, right? And so Suzanne, we may have had your com computer lock up. We'll, we'll see if we can get back to you. I'm going to ask, I have a question that I think both Philip and uh, Bob might want to take on. Aaron Dave Danis asks, what role did intelligence play in helping the Bush administration navigate the era? CIA has declassified many of the estimates from this time frame now, so there's a better accounting of its impact can be made. And of course, George Herbert Walker Bush was the CIA director. Starting with you, Philip, um, uh, what role did intelligence play during this Bush era? Um, I'll come to the intelligence point in just a second, but first, just to compliment what Susan said and answer the question of, hasn't the system created in this documentary broken down? Uh, notice at the very end of the documentary, Condi Rice says, let's not just be nostalgic, we actually have a whole new series of problems now that actually require a new series of solutions. We need to replicate the successes of transforming the system. Those were the right transformations for that time. We need new solutions for this time. Now, to come back to your question about intelligence. Actually here, I'd say that the role of intelligence was relatively modest. Uh, they're actually quite, uh, uh, serious differences in the intelligence community about how to assess the Soviet Union and Gorbachev. Uh, the Bush administration had to pick their way among these differing assessments. And one of the things they did, which Bob Zellick has stressed, is instead of getting involved in a sterile debate about whether Gorbachev will survive, let's focus on results. And let's focus on what we can achieve proactively while doing all we can to raise the odds for Gorbachev yet knowing that we can't bank on, on whether he will succeed. And so you, you have clashing intelligence assessments, none of them offering you really a Rosetta Stone.
for what's going to happen in the future. Um, you pick and choose among the information to help you shape the future. The whole point of intelligence is not to place a bet on what will happen. This is a common misconception. The point of intelligence is to help you change the future, not to help you predict it. And that's what the, and the Bush people used the information they had to try to change the future in the direction and with the results they wanted. Uh, Bob, did you want to join in on that? Yeah, um, let me just be very quick. Uh, this comes out in the film, but I can't uh, esti or overestimate it enough, is that um, President Bush uh, was a big believer in personal networks. You get that with the phone calls and the, the sort of the notes, and uh, this, this was his life. Um, and uh, he, he used this as his own intelligence network. And again, for those of us working with him, uh, we recognize that this was often a, a way that would share information. Remember, he sends Baker out right after the election on uh, a tour of the 15 other NATO countries, each capital to get to meet the people personally so as to establish those sort of uh, bonds and, and ties. Um, President Bush was an avid consumer of all sorts of information sources, obviously as the former intelligence director. However, I, my own sense is it was more of an intuitive intake than an analytical intake. And that's where the sort of the, the team comes together. As Phil said, uh, you know, actually the intelligence agencies, Bob Gates was a good representative, were actually uh, probably more cautious <laughs> about our engagement with Gorbachev uh, than we were sort of early on. And then uh, the closing point is, Diplomacy is about choices, and you can't escape that with some of these general sort of discussions. So here's a very key choice. A very key choice was that both Bush and Baker decided that Germany was our first interest. And you see this in some of the historical discussions where the people in Moscow say, oh, aren't you doing more something with Gorbachev? In a way, it's like politics. Get your base first without getting into all the details. We had problems with short range nuclear missiles, Bush comes up with a conventional forces initiative that most historians totally ignore, which is very, very critical. And it was part of, of developing um, the idea that if we're in a structural change in world history, we don't wanna screw up Germany. Let's make sure that Germany is embedded in NATO, the European Union, we have a good relationship. And I'll pose that question today. Look at our relationship with Germany today and ask yourself how this is gonna serve us with Europe in the coming decades. I, you know, we, we've got a limited amount of time and so many questions. I want to do two quick questions and whoever wants to answer, raise, raise a hand or flag it for me. Uh, Diane Ferguson asks, uh, says, thank you all. George Herbert Walker Bush managed to deal with bipartisan, to lead with bipartisan support. Can we get back to bipartisan politics with shared objectives, which are in the best interests of the country? It appears that the media, social and otherwise, fact or not, gets in the way of building trust. Media uh, is not totally blameless, but does anybody think that um, a, a return to a more bipartisan American culture will make a big difference? Anyone? Yeah, Susan. Well, look, thank you, and sorry uh, about uh, the internet. But um, look, it's uh, it's a common lament. Uh, but the truth is, is that polarization has been building up for a long time in American politics, and in many ways, that is the signal bigness difference between now and the momentous, you know, end of the Cold War period in terms of American politics. The radical shift in incentive structure. Uh, for Washington and for a po political class that has come with uh, the aging divisions in society. And the bottom line is that uh, Bush and uh, Baker might not have been inherently uh, more centrist or more bipartisan, although I think that they probably were by nature, temperament and history. But the reality is that the incentive structure was completely, and these two, as we've already said, were fanatically competitive, winning men actually doing something. Uh, and that's very clear in the many hours that we spent with uh, Secretary Baker talking with him. His incentive was to get things done. It was also his inclination, I think, as a, a natural sort of deal maker of the actual kind. Right now, the incentive is to talk 
about deals, but not to make them because in fact, there are many more good reasons if you're a politician or you've convinced yourself that there are good reasons not to make the deal, uh, which is why we have a situation this week that uh, you know unemployment benefits and help for millions and millions of Americans who've lost their jobs and are sitting at home. And our politicians have gone home for the weekend without doing anything uh, for them. I mean, that's the most basic function of government and essentially it's broken down. Um, Bob mentioned that he's reading the, the big book on Jimmy Carter right now. Uh, the last competitive election, you know, of my growing up, 1976, there were basically 24 battleground states, states whose outcome was really up in the air up until the very end. Uh, between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, the, the previous competitive election before Trump, there were only 10 states at best that were genuinely battlegrounds. Perhaps that's expanded a little bit because of the unique uh, issues with the Trump presidency. The bottom line is that Americans have sifted themselves and sorted themselves in a way that makes governing much, much harder. Can I, I might just respond on this as a end. practitioner on this? Barbara, real quickly uh, to yeah. weigh in. Barbara? Right, just on a, a domestic point uh, about sort of forced bipartisanship was the budget deal. Uh, that in, in effect caused the president in part to lose re-election. And that is because he had to go back on his promise in order to do a deal with the Democrats and they gave up some programs and he raised taxes. Uh, so uh, he, he really upset the, the Reagan wing of his party which was becoming the Republican party at that point and he wasn't viewed as the third, you know, the third term of Ronald Reagan. So uh, even when he was attempting to be bipartisan and even if it was forced on a domestic issue, uh, it, it in some ways it backfired against him. Real quickly, Philip, did you want to jump in here? Um, there, I understand the, the concern about partisanship, but it may be useful actually to keep in mind that partisan politics mostly turns on cultural issues. Mostly mass politics is about cultural identification. Politicians want you to believe, I care about the things you care about. I'm sympathetic to your world. But now think back to what Bob Zellick said at the beginning of this webinar. He kept stressing that actually foreign policy work is mainly about solving concrete problems. Mainly foreign policy is not about striking a cultural pose. I like this, I don't like that. Whether you like or don't like China isn't actually all that helpful in sitting down and working on, okay, what's the problem? Is the problem our trade balance? Is the problem technology uh, uh, competition? Is the problem Taiwan? All right, what's the solution to that problem we desire? How do you get to that solution? And very quickly, you see the cultural poses fall away. And then you get into teamwork, competence, and discipline on the problems. Uh, Bob Zellick, uh, Bob Zellick. Yeah. I'll be very brief, but um, you know, keep in mind, um, President Bush was the first president elected with a full Democratic Congress, uh, the House and the Senate, when he took office uh, for a long time. And, and, and Republican presidents after him often had either one or both bodies. And, uh, this was pretty difficult in partisan terms then. Uh, the, the, the film didn't really focus on the Nicaragua Accord, but Anne, you remember the Contra issue all throughout the Reagan administration, how it led to, frankly, prosecutions for people. Um, in March, while all this is going on, uh, Baker and I worked with him to put together an accord. It would, and it was bloody difficult and the splits were very sharp. It would have never happened if Baker hadn't had the trust that he had developed over the, the prior sort of eight years. And just to give you a sense of, of kind of how you have to connect these things, we didn't think that we were necessarily gonna get the democratic votes in the Senate for the Gulf War resolution. So Baker, one of the reasons he pushes for the UN Security Council is he believed if we got the vote of the UN Security Council, it'd be very difficult for Democrats in the Senate to say, oh, well, we won't vote for it while the UN Security Council did. So each of the contexts changed. And in the current environment, the, my own sense is that Republicans may go through a fragmentation and a bloodletting, and you'll have to figure out if you're a Democratic president, how to work with them. If you're somebody like Biden and you're coming in on a wave, you have to decide how much to sort of try to govern from the center and put together coalitions. My own sense is that Biden, if he is elected, has a possibility of doing this because he's got more legislative experience than anybody since LBJ. So the circumstances change, but the fundamentals of trust 
and trying to put together coalitions and sort of building uh, some uh, a sense of, of a common purpose remains. Well, I'm going to, uh, because we're reaching up to the last minutes of this, uh, the last question, I'm going to open it to each of you, um, uh, based on uh, something uh, Condi Rice says in the documentary. 30 years on, there is a lot to be worried about. And just so that our uh, audience can take something with them, I, I agree with Barbara that I, I see something new every time I see this documentary and, and, and how, how it filters through. Uh, Bob, let me start with you. Um, you, are, you. You are publishing a book about uh, uh, where, we, where American policy uh, came together. Um, look ahead and uh, tell me what, what you worry about in uh, 30 years on, as, as Condi said. Yeah, I, I, I differ a little bit with Condi's point. There, there's no holiday from diplomacy. And I think Baker has also made the point, which probably everybody would agree with here. You solve one problem, there's another that stems from it. You've talked about this in the nature of, of, of Europe or Russia. So that's, that's the nature of the work. So what would I focus on today? I, I think uh, the, the interesting challenge for the next president is you've got a huge domestic agenda. You're going to have a pandemic and problems with the healthcare system. You're going to have an inclusive economic recovery. You're going to have cybersecurity and also sort of digital possibilities. You've got climate change in the environment. You've got immigration. It's a staggering agenda. And so one challenge will be uh, for the president to actually take some lessons from discipline from the show and say, what is it that I'm going to try to get done and how? because actually, if you go back to the Carter, the Clinton, the Obama, they overload the system in the first two years and then there's a reaction against it. On the foreign policy side, and this is something Phil has written about, I'd look to see if you could actually have an international agenda that leverages off that. So with some of the immigration issues, I'd focus on Mexico and North America. With some of the pandemic issues, I think you could work with not only the WHO and Europe and Asia and Africa. With, uh, with some of the climate issues, the question is, if the U.S. does more domestically, how to use that as a catalyst for international diplomacy? I could go on through the list, but this is one of the challenges of the American system. You can't do everything. You get these long lists of commentators. And what this show partly demonstrates is this group got a lot done. There are some things that, that, that also sort of slipped through, and the president didn't get reelected, by the way, which is a big thing. Barbara, you, you have, uh, as our uh, political scientist, you have dealt with so many presidents uh, through ups and downs. Um, do, you, do you sense that there is, that looking forward looks more ominous than presidents saw during the time that you have been uh, studying them? Well, as the film begins by saying, we were always on the edge of not only uh, the annihilation of our country, but the annihilation of our planet. <laughs> so having grown up in the Cold War, uh, in some ways, it's hard to believe that things could be worse. But it does feel a little bit that way to me now, because we are engaged in fighting a global pandemic. Uh, so I don't think the, uh, the Earth will become extinguished, but with climate change, uh, that's a possibility as well. So uh, I just want to, I want to end with a positive that where uh, speaking to Congress in the film, Bush said, Americans are a caring, good and generous people. And he said this as he was pointing to uh, what is a, a video over that voice that he's speaking to Congress, where he's talking about the Iraqis who are being uh, taken prisoner by the Americans in the first Gulf War. And the Americans are saying, it's okay, it's okay. And I, I say, I think President Bush became a bit verklempt at that point in speaking in Congress because he was remembering back to the South Pacific in 1944 when he was drifting into a Japanese held island. Uh, so I, I wanna end on that positive note. And I think because of that, I think we will, uh, if we pick the right leaders and they engage in statecraft, uh, I think that uh, we'll come out um, in, in a positive light, but it's not a given to be sure. Susan. Sorry, thank you so much. Uh, Barbara, I appreciate uh, an act of optimism in this moment. <laughs> uh, I gotta tell you that, you know, with 160,000 Americans dead and no prospect of moving forward uh, and, and 
culminating a time, I don't see us as moving into a crisis. I believe that we are in a crisis. In fact, for the last four years, it seems very clear to me that if you want to talk about foreign policy or geopolitics, the greatest geopolitical crisis in the world today is the American crisis. Uh, the question of what role uh, this rich uh, and extraordinary uh, country uh, that has turned inward on itself uh, and is failing to lead is going to play in the world going forward. And I know that we like to comfort ourselves uh, with, uh, you know, a view of history and a view of, uh, you know, our own magnanimity or our own exceptionalism uh, that uh, makes us feel better. Uh, but uh, I think it's led us to this moment in many ways. Uh, you know, as a journalist, uh, I don't have prescriptions. Uh, I, I think in, in many ways, it's a very non-ideological kind of crisis. Uh, uh, and one that stems from some basic questions, but in terms of its geopolitical manifestations and therefore what is this team, uh, you know, from uh, a previous era, what, what can it speak to us, you know, from 30 years ago? Uh, it does suggest that the way out of the crisis might not be uh, that we might be overthinking it. <laughs> uh, and as Bob said, uh, that uh, actually every generation has to keep going. Uh, you know, you solve one problem and there's enough in nature so you don't just win and pack up and go home. Uh, and that feels like the moment that we're in, but it, I would say that it also feels very undecided what the outcome is going to be. Uh, you know, Joe Biden, from the beginning of his campaign, uh, uh, he essentially offered a promise of America can just sort of turn back the clock uh, to, you know, the role that we played in the world uh, in November 5th, 2016. I don't see that happening either. Uh, you know, countries move forward, the world moves forward. It's very hard to go backwards. So I just wanna thank everybody for this fantastic uh, discussion of this and forgive me for being a little bit darker in the conclusion. <laughs> uh, well no, said, you... Susan, well said. And, and Philip, you get the, the short last word. I just actually, I think Susan actually uh... Uh, offered a terrific summary, and I would just uh, say I think she's she's nailed it. Uh, this is a, a really important moment in American and world history, and that's why uh, the discussion we have today is so timely. Philip Zellico, Susan Glasser, Barbara Perry, Bob Zellick, thank you for the panelists. And please, all of you who are watching, you can still until September 1st, view this statecraft documentary on the pbs.org uh, website. You can uh, log in and find it. Thank you so much for sticking with us and, in, uh, and uh, asking such good questions. On behalf of the Miller Center and VPM and all those who work so hard on statecraft, the Bush 41 team, thank you for joining us. Be good. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you.